So I want to welcome you all uh, that have joined us on Zoom and um, to uh, and, and apparently now YouTube uh, that we're talking about the coronavirus and just some of the fears and how the gospel affects that. And so today what we're going to do is something a little bit different. I'm going to do uh, a little bit more teaching uh, on just the Enneagram and different triggers and, and how you so might unconsciously how you might be unconsciously be able processing this and responding and reacting to the ways that you may not recognize in yourself. And so uh, tomorrow we are going to uh, bring on a gentleman named Tyler Zach, who is a really good friend and has done a really good job uh, with a lot of our social media. Uh, and he's an Enneagram expert and a pastor of a multiracial church in Omaha, Nebraska. On Thursday, I'm really excited about a guy named Jerry Corver joining us. He uh, is in wealth management, CPA, and certified financial planner. And he's really looked at the book of Exodus and compares Pharaoh's economy with our economy and how radically different the economies are. One is a fear-based and the other one is a love-based. And all the reactions and all that's what he's watching uh, and we're watching, but him specifically through the clients that are calling and moving money around and those kind of things, that's going to be on Thursday. And, uh, and I'm really uh, impressed with Jared's work with that. So he's going to be on Thursday. And then on Friday, uh, Russell McCutcheon is going to join us. Uh, he's helping start a church here in Raleigh, North Carolina, a multiracial church that really helps uh, empower uh, those that are under-resourced uh, with the body of Christ. And so he's going to talk to us about how to love our under-resourced neighbor. Many people, as you know, um, that are working hourly are, are really, we're formally just living paycheck to paycheck, uh, possibly middle class or, or even lower to middle class. But um, often, you know, you could just imagine there's this whole swath, uh, so whole swath of our economy that is being vulnerable now uh, because of that. Many of us are. Uh, in fact, my wife really pulled me aside this morning and said, uh, you're being controlling. <laughs> and, uh, and, and a lot of that was honestly just from the anxiety and the way I was expressing that uh, today. So what I want to do today is look a little bit more again for those of you that in, have enjoyed the Enneagram, have seen the, the some of the benefits of that helps you with your stressors and self-awareness is to walk you through uh, a couple of uh, ways that you may be perceiving processing and responding to this to help you start paying attention to that and then to open yourself up to God's grace. One thing my wife said this morning was we just need to be a people of grace. Receiving grace from God giving grace uh, to one another and allowing us to not handle everything just right when we are getting concerned and when we are getting worried about uh, how we're going to be able to take care of things or how we're going to have our needs taken care of. What we know for sure is that God um, has really taken care of us. And so I just want to encourage you as you explore this with us, and we go in the next 30 minutes or so that you really open yourself up and say, okay, let me just take, let me take a deep breath and to really, uh, to see how we're, how I'm processing this. I'm also going to at the end interview Jessica, who was on here a minute ago, uh, Penley, who was on the call yesterday and we had a really significant call this morning that I really appreciate her perspective. So I asked for her to speak up towards the end of this. All right, so let me share with you a little bit uh, of Enneagram information. If you remember, if you're not familiar with our work at all, uh, basically, we started something with the gospel Enneagrams. Basically, an approach to the Enneagram that is in overtly uh, saying, how does the gospel help us understand our motivations and behaviors? If you're familiar with the Enneagram, there are nine different types or styles uh, that are organized around this diagram. Any of in Greek means nine, gram means to write. Here is this diagram that was passed around 
orally. No one really knows the origins of it. It's a little bit different than most other personality tools because it really measures health. It measures uh, character. It, it helps us understand who we are uh, when we're not walking with the Lord, to use Christian language, and who we are when we're really walking with the Lord and becoming more and more like Christ. We're growing to be like him. We are uh, participating with him in our sanctification process. And so there are these nine types. The, I'm the enthusiast. Uh, I'm just happy. I like to be happy. That's my deal. <laughs> um, we all like to be happy, but I really like to be happy. Uh, eights are challengers. Nines are peacemakers. Ones are called reformers. Twos are called helpers. Threes are called achievers. Fours are individualists. Fives are investigators and six are loyalists. So I want to talk to you a little bit about what this does. This is a pathway. It's a map. It's a road map that tells you how to get from vice to virtue. In fact, the original eight um, deadly sins, which later was condensed to seven, is embedded in this. That doesn't necessarily mean it's Christian. Some people think it is. I'm not quite convinced. Other people think it was a missionary tool to reach Muslims for Christ way back a couple of years, a thousand years ago. We don't know. Um, there's been all kinds of people that have got the hold of this. Uh, certainly our modern understanding of this was shaped in part by people that were not Christians. But a lot of Christians uh, have put their fingerprints in it. Um, the uh, material is a little bit like sitting on your grandmother's front porch. There's been some uh, testing and empirical advice, mo mostly from Jerome Wagner at Loyola, Loyola I didn't know how to say that, uh, University. Uh, he's done a lot of work on it and others, but for the most part, it's helpful to think of it as sitting on your grandmother's front porch and hearing some uh, helpful things to consider in life. It basically maps nine different motivations of the soul. And uh, the way I think it's helpful to understand it is if it's a GPS or if it's a roadmap that tells you where you are and where you need to go towards health, it's helpful to realize you're not going to get there with just the Enneagram yourself. It is ultimately the gospel. It is the power of God through the person of Jesus Christ and the uh, administered through the Holy Spirit today that we are able to grow. He is the engine. He is the vehicle. You may understand what unhealth, uh, an unhealthy lifestyle and a healthy lifestyle looks like in, in given your personality, what character growth would be, but it is only the power of the gospel. And so there's a couple of ways we explain this. One helpful way, it's a little bit different from what you would see on our material um, with our online videos is this from World Harvest Mission. And I believe originally uh, from a guy named Paul Miller. Basically, he says, you know, there's a way of looking at your life through time. And at some point, you come to realize that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and rose from the grave. Typically, we call this conversion. And at this point, we saw the need, our awareness of God's holiness, of how he's separate and he's beautiful and he's great and far and above us. And the awareness of our sin, our particular sin, is what the Enneagram gets at. I'll explain that in a second. But it, it's the cross that is the bridge. Now here, it's not so much that the cross gets bigger. But as we go through time, as we age, the awareness of God's holiness and our particular sin, that is the sin that particularly motivates us, that, that is embedded in who we are. That's a kind of a Calvin term. Um, in a Westminster Catechism uh, term there that helps us understand that we, uh, as we get older, that the worship of the cross gets bigger, uh, our perception, our realization of how big this bridge is. Again, not that the cross gets bigger, but our awareness of it does. One of the things that can happen often is stunted growth. Um, with evangelicals in particular and Protestants in general, we are right to say that God loves me and I'm a sinner. But a lot of times what happens is we don't really engage with the scripture or in spiritual formation enough. And so we actually become less aware of who God is. We don't study him and his attributes. We don't study the magnitude of, of his character and what he's done and interacting with us. And also because we're kind of like, 
clueless. <laughs> Uh, we often don't understand what's motivating us. And so uh, really the, the pursuit of theology um, in general is really a lot of the work of the mind uh, that can happen here, that we can grow on the top side. And that is wonderful and obviously a completely necessary thing. But if it's not coupled with me becoming more aware of who I am and what's really driving me, uh, in my heart, what will happen is kind of a heady move uh, in, um, in our Christianity. Now, this is theory, uh, but I hope you get the idea of what we're communicating. There are things that we can do to stunt our growth. What we're doing with the Enneagram is it is a tool. It's not the tool. It is not necessarily biblically inspired. It is something from general revelation that can help us grow in that. Furthermore, and this is what's our motivation, it's a great tool right now uh, to talk to people uh, about Jesus and to talk to them about the need for character growth and what is the engine that's going to help them grow into a more healthy lifestyle. Uh, that is a wide open door uh, for sharing the good news of Christ with people. It is a wide open door. People will not talk to you as much as we they used to about what is truth. But, but if you want to say, hey, I will give you an assessment to help you understand yourself, it's a wide open door. Uh, and uh, it really goes after people are, are longing, their desires are very much like the ancients, like Augustine especially, that desired um, uh, uh, to hit the road and to find home and to find themselves. Well, uh, the Enneagram is a beginning of the conversation, but they can't fully find themselves unless they come into the braces of God and his people, church. So there we go. <laughs> I told you we're going to be a little bit more teaching. So let's go into stressors and false beliefs of uh, each. Um, and then we'll um, talk a little bit uh, about the good news in a minute towards these. So I am a seven and like... Like I mentioned, I'm all into happiness. There was something in me as a child that just thought I must find ways to be happy. Uh, before I even realized this consciously was going on in me, I was constantly pursuing uh, happiness to the degree that I fear being trapped in circumstances uh, like this one, where uh, you know we'll lose um, money in a 401k, that I may lose my father, that I may that I may uh, have limitations, that I can't go to uh, and move about like I really wanted to. Um, and so what can happen is for me, that anxiety goes up, but a lot of it is this trapped feeling. Um, I usually find ways for me to be bored all the time. So it's constantly about strategies of how to do this. So this is when I'm at my worst, believing that I must do it. Notice the imperative nature of it. It is the spiritual orphan belief system. It's as if I'm acting as if I'm not a child of God and that the reign of grace is not apparent right now. I have a friend of mine that's an eight and uh, he's, uh, he, he is literally going out and serving all kinds of people, which is great. But when I asked him how he's doing, uh, he said to me the other day, I'm afraid to really tell you, he was very honest, and I love this, I'm afraid to tell you how I'm really doing. And that was a really great move in vulnerability because uh, he was saying, I'm feeling vulnerable, and it's up to me to be strong. And so we talked about it a little bit, and he, and he said, yeah, you know, right now I feel like I'm just trying to save the world because it's up to me to be strong. And I didn't actually say that last half, but that was the essence of what he said. My wife is the most wonderful person in the world. What she does, because her childhood orphan belief system can be, I must keep the be peace. You know, she's smoothing things over. When we're having disruption in our family, uh, and this can be really helpful at these times, but the way she's doing it, a lot of times, uh, though she's done uh, better, is to tiptoe uh, around uh, a family that is dealing with conflict. And it's almost a hurdle where she feels like I'm the glue. And honestly, in our family, we can get used to her being the glue and can help trap her into that role. Uh, well, this morning when she talked to me, 
about how I was doing it, it really opened up because she was saying at the same time, okay, I there's we're five, six days into the realization that uh, that there's conflict, that there's anxiety, that there's disruption. And I just need to let go of control and just say it and just embrace it. And that was a really mature move for her. Um, many people at this moment are trying to do exactly the right thing because they would never want to be a bad boy or bad girl as if you know they were told that or worried about being told that when they're a child. And so they honestly are handling things the way you're supposed to handle things, but there's still a lot of stress. We'll talk a little bit about the way they handle that in more in a minute. Twos are out there loving all kinds of people. <laughs> I mean, they are uh, <clears throat> in general, just, you know, really just can't wait to help serve the next person. And honestly, uh, maybe honestly doing that more than others, but sometimes that can be from a place of the I must love to be accepted because the, uh, the stress is if they're not wanted. Well, at this time, Helpers are really, really wanted at this time. And so uh, they can receive this. But after a while, um, five, six days, maybe seven days when, depending on how soon, long ago, they realized uh, some of the issues that we were going to face. Uh, they basically uh, can get exhausted like the rest of us, but they'll keep serving and serving and serving as a way to feel that void. Uh, threes feel failure or being incompetent. Uh, I've talked to a couple threes that are really uh, discouraged about the staff stock market because they feel like they're losing. Um, I appreciated the honesty because um, I think most people with the stock market aren't talking about it as much because they realize there are other pressing issues and this is just their 401k. Um, but there is this sense of failure that, that can happen. Threes tend to have this um, achiever mindset that I must achieve to prove myself. There's a justification that goes with that. Uh, fours can uh, can really bear the brunt of this time. Uh, in a lot of ways, they fear being an authentic or rejection. Uh, it's not so much um, that people are rejecting fours all, all over the place here, but uh, the uniqueness of the time and to really be a highly empathetic person, engage with emotions and feel, making people feel special and making sure that they feel special, um, that, that it could be a difficult time. Uh, fives, uh, honestly, tend to retreat, think it through. Some of my best uh, friends that are fives that are pastors helped me really uh, as a coach uh, worked with some churches and worked with some leaders on, on how we are going to um, handle this time intellectually, and they were really, really helpful, but a lot of them uh, are quite worn out, but also still in retreat mode when they're not doing well. Stressors for sixes are worst case scenarios. Honestly, some sixes saw this coming uh, a month ago and already thought it through, and now that it's here, sometimes they're actually better after the issue has arrived because it's not quite as thought bad yet as they thought. And of course, because the, uh, the bulk of the uh, spread of the uh, coronavirus hasn't really been as prevalent uh, yet, they're, they're usually worst case scenarios are still going on in their head. So they are the, our night watchmen. Uh, they're the ones that must be vigilant uh, to stay safe. Now, here's, here's, here's where it gets interesting. And this is where the, the conversation is going to get really productive uh, for you. The question is, what's the defense mechanism? Well, first of all, a defense mechanism is an unconscious psychological strategy to help us deal with times like this. It's an unconscious strategy, OK? So what's going on in our mind? We may be having an orphan belief system, like as a seven, of the I must find ways to, to be happy because my fear is I'm going to get trapped or bored. Well, how do I handle that? What is that defense mechanism that fakes me out? Well, for a seven, it's rationalization. I actually called my wife last 
Thursday and said, listen, what do you think about us just going to, and I was half kidding and half serious about just going ahead and getting the coronavirus. I mean, there's only a two or 3% chance that we'll get it and we'll go hit a cruise. <laughs> and I checked cruise prices and they're super cheap. And of course they're all canceled now. Uh, but there is this rationalization of like, hey, this is all going to be, we can make this into a happy experience, which is not in reality. You know, it is not uh, having your feet on the ground, uh, and it is certainly not being present. My wife just, of course, appropriately uh, snickered and then rolled her eyes. For an aide, this uh, feeling of vulnerability uh, can be denial. I'm all right. You know, that's why it was so mature for my eight friend to basically admit that he didn't want to admit feeling vulnerable uh, because usually there's just denial uh, that we don't have a problem. For nines, uh, there's a narcotization. Basically, a nine turns down the volume of their own opinion. And what actually happens, it's not just that they'll go watch a lot, not a lot of Netflix or take a nap, though it can do that. It's that if I have to manage all these other people and get everybody else around this, uh, all the other motivations here, uh, have a harmonious and peace, I'm not gonna bring up my own opinion. So what happens is they turn down the volume, they numb out their own uh, themselves or numb out their own opinion specifically. When in essence, like my wife this morning, when she said something, she turned up the volume, it was really very helpful. And so that defense mechanism is, uh, is what's natural for a nine. If you're a nine and you're turning down the volume on yourself, uh, that's a sign of stress. Uh, ones tend to react by forming their behaviors in their words, especially just exactly right. So they wanna, don't want to make mistakes. They wanna handle things perfectly. But even in the reactions, they'll slow down and they might be irritable or angry, they, they won't say it, but they'll say just the right words for us to have a productive conversation because it's up to them, up to, them to make it right. Now that's a lot of pressure and you can see how we can be, those two, nine and one can be really helpful as we make productive conversations as well as a few others here. But a lot of it is a survival strategy. So if you find yourself, you know, the anxiety increasing and you've got to handle things just right, you realize what's going on here is this false belief is really uh, going on at a higher level and you need to pay attention to it. Uh, repression for twos, of course, it makes sense as if they're out there taking care of themselves or they repress their feelings. A lot of them will think that soul care can be very selfish. When in essence, if they would just take in 15, 20 minutes to deal with their own anxieties, their, their ability to serve would increase uh, because it's, of course, more truly unconditional love than it is necessarily wanting to earn other people's loves. Uh, identification with threes. Uh, one way they can handle this is look at who else is doing something um, successful and identify with that. Uh, the, my friends that were talking about the stock market I don't know if this is happening with them, but it's not unusual for threes to be looking at their other mentors or other market strategists and figuring out exactly what's the best way to move around things right now so that, uh, so that you know, we lose the less money. That's a fine and good thing. The issue is when it's motivated by this place of fearing failure of like, that's the worst thing that can happen. That's not well. Now I mentioned fours can really deal with a lot of the stress. What fours do is a defense mechanism called interjection. They take somebody else's problem and into themselves. Well, there's anxiety all around and they can feel those emotions. And instead of staying well differentiated or separate from somebody else's issue and still being empathetic, instead of letting the other person carry their own monkey on their back while I'm empathetically engaging with them. Instead of four, we'll take that monkey and put it on their back too. 
And so what happens in these times is floors can be really, really worn out by the, uh, and feel some of the anxiety the most. Uh, with fives, isolation, I kind of already addressed that, it makes sense. If you want to back up and think it through and sit in a place and read it, the internet and understand the research in order for you to be confident in how to handle it, well, that isolation just can happen more and more. And for, for us to do be engaged in social distancing, which is really, really good, uh, strategy to meet, mitigate um, the spread of the coronavirus, uh, it also can feed a fives uh, withdrawal, which it can get to be dangerous after uh, a week or two. That's true for all of us, but especially fives. And then sixes can deal with projection. They can project the problems on there. Why didn't China do this? Well, you know, some of that's going to be fair to ask questions and to do that. But a lot of times the sixes will notice projecting problems out there on others, while other sixes really project problems on themselves uh, and kind of have an, this inner committee going on that it must be my fault somehow and I must be uh, having trouble having deviance. Now that's a lot of information. If you want to real quick, just take a screenshot uh, or later on you can pull up the video and write it down, feel free, but, but that's a lot of information on one slide. But what I want to show you here is pulling back the layers of our reactions uh, to, to realize that these defense mechanisms in gold might be what you pick up on quicker but you got to realize a lot of times these are these stressors in these false beliefs are at the heart of that. And really what God wants to do is uproot these things and put them uh, instead with his truth. So I'm going to, I'm going to move on to the slide on the truth and the lies. And let's talk about this. The truth and the lies are here for seven is instead of I must find ways to be happy. I need to come back to the fact that, Christ is my joy. Um, John 15 has always meant a lot to me. Abide in Christ is basically uh, what he's calling me to, to have all my needs met in him, to be intimately connected to Christ, because he says in verse 12, or 11 actually, that this is, uh, this is abiding in Christ is uh, results in full joy for me. You know, and for us, actually, it's all second person plural. So we are to abide in Christ. And that's intended for our joy. Uh, what happens is when my feet are grounded, I quit rationalizing. Uh, I allow this orphan belief system or I must find ways to be happy. It's a reminder that my shadow is, is cast on the wall. And when I don't box the shadow and get angry at myself or 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 turn my back on it, but when I realize this, this thing and these reactions, these stressors and these false beliefs are here, are casting a shout on the wall. And that's helpful because what that means is I need to get under the light. It's a, it's a helpful thing to see that in yourself because it's a reminder that I need to now walk under the light. And when I walk under the light, that minimizes the shadow. For an aid, instead of I must be strong, coming back to the simple truth that Christ is my strength. I think about um, 1 Corinthians or Colossians 1, 13, where it talks about how Christ has uh, delivered us from a dominion of darkness to his, uh, to his kingdom. Uh, there is this victory that has happened, that the strength is in Christ. So therefore, I don't have to be strong. I can be vulnerable. For nine, I think about reconciliation, that Christ is our peace. He's the one that reconciles us. He's the one that pulls us together. And if you really look at what's going around, there's a lot of pulling together that is happening. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing. Well, really, uh, a lot of that is really the administration of the Holy Spirit that is active, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit that is active, where Christ is bringing peace that people are rolling up their sleeves and caring for one another. But for a nine, they can come to the realization of, you know what? I don't have to be the one that keeps the peace. That's Christ's job. And yet they're called like the doctrine of reconciliation to be engaged, to reconcile, to turn up their volume of the voice and to speak out and to speak into. 
And that's what's really helpful, I find, for a lot of guys. Christ made me righteous is the doctrine of imputation that he gives us his righteousness. That while, uh, uh, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that means we are justified and imputed with his righteousness. So I don't have to be perfect. Christ is the one that gets it right. Christ is the one that's perfect. And Christ is the one that makes me perfect uh, and makes me righteous, um, to be more specific. And... Uh, what that means is the pressure is off. I don't have to form every reaction and something that I get off uh, is going to be all right. It's going to be okay. Christ accepts me uh, is what twos need to hear. Think about a two that's really serving people right now out of the longing to be accepted uh, versus the two that already has their needs met uh, fully knowing that Christ accepts them and then they operate from that uh, acceptance. Now that is a totally different uh, pair of hands. One hand has strings <laughs> and they're holding them. There's strings attached to the giving and the other one has no strings and their hands are open and they're generous and they really are showing us what it looks like for Christ to help and to serve. For three, that might be working going back to the same illustration, which three are more interested in just this, but just to carry it through with the stock market and, and having a loss, they can look at a loss and see a loss for what it is. It's not a loss on their value. It's not a loss on who they are because Christ is the one that justifies them. Uh, you know, in math, your math teacher might say, justify your work, you know, show me how you got your answer. When three say they are justified by Christ's answer, it's a beautiful thing that they then are able to engage failure uh, of finances and not bring it into themselves or see their identity in the path. For fours, uh, that Christ created me unique. What that happens is instead of necessarily feeling special, feeling emotionally, having their emotional needs met by another person. Or, but when they really are filled up with the love of Christ, they realize God created me unique. You know, I don't have to get down in completely in the dark. I can engage there and that's fine. But I'm going to realize in the meantime that I hold my value. And when I'm filled up with the love of Christ, I can let other people carry their emotions, still be engaged but also not necessarily um, be enmeshed in somebody else's problems. A couple more here. The Holy Spirit guides me. I think this is really helpful for five. It, it's a little bit of a turn here as we talked about Christ. Holy, the Holy Spirit is the agent of Christ. What this means is, um, is that the Holy Spirit really brings everything of five really wants. He brings knowledge through the revealed word of the scriptures, the Bible. Uh, he gives empowerment power to get up and engage when they want to withdraw. Uh, and they give guidance of how to speak truth and to speak wisdom. And, and so whenever I don't have to be confident, but I realize that the Holy Spirit is confident, it, it's a game changer for fives. And then finally, lastly, Christ is my security. Uh, and we're talking about eternal security, but eternal security talks starts now. It's like this moment and forever, yes. It's not more than just, uh, I'm not going to ever lose my salvation. It's, it's that, but it's more than that. It's that God's got me now, that God's got us, that God is the shepherd that is vigilant, that he is the one that stays watch and is um, oh, having to watch over his sheep. So these are, uh, some of the things I just want to encourage you with as we kind of get into a little bit of time of, of teaching here um, on this. So if you want to take a screenshot of this, this is really helpful. Now, all this material um, is online, though I summarize tons really quick, probably too quickly. But if you know your Enneagram type, I'm hoping that you are able to really start seeing indicators of what's going on with you. Uh, especially those defense mechanisms and those uh, core beliefs, those lies, and, and start to invite you to rest in the finished work of Christ and uh, in the sanctifying truth of 
of what we learn in the scriptures. And so uh, I hope this is helpful for you. Now, what I want to do now is uh, talk to Jessica Pendling. We had a series of conversations, Jessica and I, uh, this morning, as I mentioned, that was really, really helpful and was going along the lines of where we're going today. Uh, she tuned in yesterday, and, and I just appreciated it. So, um, Jessica, if you would just unmute yourself and share a little bit about yourself and, uh, to give us a little context of who you are. Yeah, so my name is Jessica, and I am a second grade teacher, and I also have a dance company for adults that I started a few years ago. Okay, cool. Awesome. Yeah, uh, and uh, she's taught. I knew her from the church we used to go to that her husband's employed with, and uh, and then um, she taught my daughter dance, too. So uh, it's been a it's been a nice relationship we've had for several years. Um, tell us a little bit about your experience with anxiety. So I'm pretty sure that I'm a six um, on the Enneagram, and um, I definitely relate to the anxiety part of being a six. I've, I remember being anxious for most of my life. I can have, I can think back on memories of being anxious um, in my childhood and all the way up to today. Um, and sometimes it's been really intense. Like it has involved having panic attacks and um, needing therapy and just seeking all sorts of resources and help. Um, so yeah, I'm very familiar with anxiety. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to hear that. So what, like, give us a, what's it been like in the last week or two? Uh, for you when when did you first realize okay we got a problem coming on first of all because <laughs> I'm curious about that uh, and then how's that played out for you in the past week well I mean I was aware of coronavirus for a while but I was kind of avoiding it mm -hmm. um, I just didn't I knew if I started to learn about it I would kind of get caught in wanting to learn more and more and I would probably get overly anxious about it. So I was really avoiding it until I heard about a case in Raleigh and then I felt responsible as a teacher to be more informed so that I could be doing everything I could in my classroom to um, just keep the kids washing their hands and keeping the classroom disinfected mm -hmm. so um i yeah a couple of weeks ago posted on my whiteboard in my classroom a list of rules for the kids to follow um, and i normally am very vigilant about lots of things at school like i'm constantly counting my kids like are they all still in here mm -hmm. um and so it just kind of, coronavirus coming to Raleigh gave me an extra set of things to be vigilant about. Mm -hmm. um, like a student would cough and I would be like, I told you to cough into a tissue. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so yeah. there is just um, more pressure to be even more vigilant. So um, then last Wednesday night, we heard about a mm -hmm. potential um, exposure involving our school and so our school closed um, for the rest of the week and we uh, we won't be back for at least two weeks okay right. yeah yeah uh, it can be a lot um, you know um, married to a teacher and, <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm glad that y'all had spring break already because we did not what uh, what have you been what have you found to be helpful personally? I'd like you to share some of what we talked about before and just uh, yeah, what's been helpful for you? Yeah, so since I've dealt with anxiety for years, I have a toolbox already with different strategies to calm down. But one one um, resource that has really helped me throughout the years and definitely just being more more and more concerned about the coronavirus has been um, 
a quote from a workbook that I went through a few years ago. The workbook is called When I Am Afraid by Ed Welch, and it goes along with his book called Running Scared. But the quote is, um, act on the grace God gives you today and wait confidently for the grace God will give you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So that's just like, throughout the years, that's been one of my mm -hmm. things that I can think about that just has helped me so many times and it's definitely helping in the past few days. Yeah, because, you know, for me, um, I can I can be focused, which is right and good on the grace for today. <laughs> um, but a lot of times, uh, part of the reason why I have trouble in having faith in today is because of worry about tomorrow, you know, and um, read the quote one more time again, if you don't mind. Act on the grace God gives you today and wait confidently for the grace God will give you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's very good. Okay, I'd like to open it up for any questions or, or thoughts um, for anybody else that is joining us. Hi, I'm Ellen, and I, I'm, I'm a professor at a university, and so I can relate, uh, Jessica, to your, to, to your sense of where are the students and how are they doing and all of that kind of thing. I do think, though, John, as I was listening to you, I, I, you're so spot on, and um, it's just great to see the the focus that you have and the ability that you have to translate, if you will, Enneagram into this everyday tool to help us really start to see how we can um, use this to help other people, even if they don't know Enneagram, that we can help other people begin to get that perspective that they particularly need um, mm -hmm. to help them weather, weather this situation. So I, I just thank you so much for doing this. And um, oh, yeah. I've already shared uh, it with a couple of people that I knew, particularly a four uh, uh -huh. uh, that I, I knew needed to, to hear what you had to say today. Uh, and I sent her both your stress one and your, and your uh, in Christ one. What I, oh, that's good. Cool. Oh, <laughs> good. So I really, really do appreciate that. Thank you, Jessica, too, for sharing your information. Yeah, thank you, Alan. I appreciate that encouragement. Yeah, that's very encouraging. <laughs> Any other questions or thoughts? Well, feel free to stick around here in a minute. Um, I'd like to just spend a little time and pray for every one of you uh, and for us to be able to really um, lean into the grace to the Lord today and tomorrow. Uh, and allow ourselves to see these triggers in ourselves or, or uh, reactions in ourselves as an opportunity for us to turn to the Lord. And actually, instead of just getting mad at ourselves uh, for our reaction, to uh, use them as indicators that we need to get, we need to get um, and turn to the Lord. So let's do that. Heavenly Father, I... Uh, well, you know, we can all just feel the fear and anxiety around us. But that is not from you. Help us uh, feel the comfort and guidance and power that you have. Lord, there are thousands of questions that we cannot answer that can lead us to worry. Uh, help us remember that you reign and that you live is enough for now. And Father, I pray for uh, the people joining on us, the Smice in, um, in Johnson City, the Agnews in Nashville, the Scots in, uh, in um, Chattanooga, and then JB and LaToya and Stacy and um, and I, Jessica and Jordan uh, and Alan, I pray, Father, that you would be with them and let them know that, that you are here today and that you will walk with us tomorrow. 
that we may fully rest in you and that through that rest, we would be able to serve. And we would be able to serve from a place uh, where we are filled up with the love of God. I pray this in your son's name. Amen. So let me leave you with the last thought. That's pretty much another way of summarizing this. Uh, Jordan Penley is on here. Gave me this. It sits on my desk. It's a mug. Consider your life a mug where there's water um, um, pouring in. You've got needs. I've got needs. And a lot of times uh, this mug can have a crack. Uh, and at times like this, we whatever has been poured in can be leaked out. And so what we really need in these times uh, to be able to offer other people uh, what we've been given uh, is we need to pray for healing in ourselves. And God's going to bring up moments like this and things like this and things from our past to bring healing. And then God is going to continue to uh, fill us up. The one thing I don't want you to do is put your hand on top, you know, is to buckle down is to uh, find your own strategies uh, to be, um, to make life more in control, but to surrender yourself to the reality in order to open yourself up and surrender yourself to the love of God. When this is healed and when you are filled up with the love of God, it really is when you can love others out of the overflow of what, um, of what he's done. And so if you consider yourself a cup, I just want to encourage you to just allow grace upon grace upon grace to fill you up, uh, to encourage you as you move on today. So uh, thank you guys for joining us. I also want to just uh, encourage you, if you haven't already, to download that worksheet we mentioned yesterday that's on the website, gospelintegram.com. There's a resource called Fuel. It'll help you slow down, open, answer some open-ended questions and help you reset and fill up with the grace of God. Um, there's going to be a couple other downloads on there too. We just threw, I just threw on extras just for fun. And then tomorrow, remember, we're going to talk about uh, more, a little bit more with the Enneagram and Tyler Zach, uh, pastor at a multiracial church in Omaha. Then we're on Thursday, we're going to talk about a fear-based economy versus God's economy. And, and you're going to be able to see this contrast even more of what God's calling you to with a friend named Jared Corver. And then on Friday, we're going to talk about how to love your under-resourced neighbor with Russell McCutcheon. So stick around if you like. I'm going to stop the recording uh, here in a second. Uh, but if you want to stick around uh, and ask some more questions, uh, uh, we can. So let me...